Hey guys, welcome back to our YouTube channel. It's a girl Fanny Lungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. Today, I'm going to be reacting to this. It's a combat story, but the title is not in English, so I can't read that out. But this is what I'm going to be reacting to. If there's anything you guys want us to react to, drop the link down below. We'll be more than glad to react to it. And welcome or welcome back to our channel hope you guys are enjoying the content that we're putting out we're trying to be as consistent as we were before and hope you guys can see that otherwise enjoy so without wasting time let's get into the video my name originally was julie carol saunders and um when i was born i was born in a small village in the middle of northamptonshire I had about less than 100 people my father was the butcher, he was an atheist, and my mother was a housewife, also an atheist. Um, because of the ill health of my brother, I was sent to live with my grandmother, who was a Baptist Christian. And it was in the same village, only a few doors down. So I grew up as a Baptist. So I led a very simple, almost luxurious life. There was no hassle, no trouble, no nothing. Very quiet. And I went through school at Wollaston. And then I went, I was going to go into veterinary, but I damaged my back, so I couldn't. So I went into medicine and I became a chiropodist. And I was also very active in the church. I ran the toddler group. I used to go to all the prayer meetings, all the study groups. I ran the old people's coffee mornings. And it was a big part of my life. And while I was, when I started my own business, it was a little bit slow. And I asked my friend, find me some volunteer work through the church to give me something to do. So she put me onto an organization called Women's Aid, the Battered Wives Association, as it was known then. And I started working there. And I met this lovely lady, Hamida. And we got on very, very well. And after quite a few years of knowing her, more than 10 years of working with her, a conversation had happened between a new lady who'd come, and we were all talking about religion. We were talking, one was Catholic, the other was Methodist, and I was Baptist, and we were all discussing religion. And Hamida sat there very quietly. So we asked Hamida, what is your religion? Because she was such a wonderful woman, the most patient, the quietest, nothing upset her, nothing phased her. Nobody knew what religion she was. And then I asked her, what religion are you? And she said, Muslim. I was horrified. I was absolutely stunned and mortified that this educated woman could follow such a barbaric religion because that's how it's shown. So I tried very, very hard to turn her to Christian. I was unrelenting. Every time we spoke, I spoke about religion. I was determined what I thought to pull this poor woman from a barbaric religion to give her the freedom of Christianity. She didn't wear hijab, and um, I struggled and struggled, and in the end I think she got a bit tired of it. So she said to me, okay, if you can find any problem with Islam, any fault, anything incorrect with Islam, not with Muslim people, with Islam, I will become a Christian. So I thought, oh, challenge accepted, this is going to be easy. I said, okay, so how do I find out? She gave me one book called The Bent Rib about feminism in Islam. I read it, I thought, this is fantastic. This can't be right because this is not what we're shown. So I thought, oh, she's given me something that's biased to mislead me. So I went to an Islamic shop in London and the man there was very unfriendly. He had no intention of selling me anything. He was quite abrupt and rude to me about the way I dressed and wouldn't help me. So I left and I said to Hermida with the story of what had happened and she said, ah, but that's Muslim people. That's not Islam. She told me another shop to go to in Luton, the Zamzam. And the man in there, although he looked very scary with a big beard and he wore the throbe and he looked as scary as the other guy, he was wonderful. He tolerated my five children in the shop and he helped me. I, picked, I went past him. I didn't want to ask him after the reaction the other man had given me. So I thought, I'm just going to look round. So I looked and I looked and I found one book about women in Islam. 
I think it was called The Purpose of Women in Islam. So I thought, okay, I'll get this one. There must be something in there from what I've seen of Islam. There must be something useful in there to beat her with. There must be something I can say, look, this is wrong. So I thought, great, I'll get this one. And the gentleman in the shop came over and said, Salam Alaikum, sister. I had no idea what he was saying apart from the sister. And then he said, can I help you? And I thought, help you I can get. So I said, yeah, I'm looking for something to learn about Islam. So he said, oh, that's fantastic. And he showed me two other books. So I said, OK, I'll get those. One was a book called The, the Life of the Prophet or The Story of the Prophet by Martin Lings. And it was written in pure English. It was written by an English man. And it was more of a story than a reference book. So it was wonderful. It gave me the, the right story. And I bought the three books. I went to the till. I paid for the three books. And my kids started, we want to go for chicken. So we went down the road to the Sam's chicken shop and the kids sat there with their chicken and chips quite happy. And I thought, I'll read the, have a look at these books while I'm waiting for them to finish. I opened the bag, there were seven books. I thought, oh my God, he's given me someone else's books or I've picked them up by mistake and I was really worried. So I picked the receipt out. No, I'd only bought three books. So I said to my son who was older than, I think he was about 12 or 13, I gave him the books, the four books that I hadn't bought and the receipt. And I said, please take these back to the gentleman and say, I'm really sorry. I must have taken them by mistake. And my son came back with the same three books. And he said, no, the man said, this is a gift for you. And I was really surprised. You never get that in an English shop. <laughs> this man had given me a, a copy of the Quran with English translation, a book about Islamic dress, I think it was, and another one, I can't remember what it was. But they were lovely books. So I went and I read them all and I couldn't find any faults. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna to have to go deeper into this because this still looks wonderful. This is not what I'm expecting. So there was a program on the telly about some problem with Islam. I watched the program on the television about the abuse of women and some women were being stoned for the problems they'd caused. So I thought, ah, this is more what I need to find out about. How, they, how, how can they do this? How can they justify this? This is wrong. So they were talking about the Sharia law. I thought, ah, this is the piece of Islam that must be wrong. So I went back to the same bookshop and the gentleman recognized me, which was quite good because it was a couple of months afterwards. And he asked me how I enjoyed the books. I said, they were fantastic, but now I want a book about Sharia law. And he looked a bit surprised. He said, that's a bit heavy for someone just learning about Islam. I said, no, I feel I need this book. So he gave me, well, I bought one book on Sharia law. And then with it, he gave me another one, which was something about explaining the law and how it applies. And I read them and I thought, to be honest, in England a hundred years ago, we had a lot worse than this. We had a very lot of unjust rules. I love history, so I'd studied history. And I knew that in England, if you stole something, they wouldn't just cut your hand. Or if you stole food, they wouldn't forgive you. It was very common when the famine was on that men who stole a sheep would be hanged, even if it was to feed their family who were dying. They would hang them, they would kill them. So thinking in comparison, really cutting your hand was not that bad. So I thought, okay, let's find this bit where the women get stoned. And that was for adultery. Well, in England, a few hundred years ago, they would have drowned them. And I studied and I studied for almost a year. And every day, Hamida, when I saw her, would say, so how are you doing? Found anything yet? I said, no, but I will. Inshallah, I will. Well, I didn't say inshallah then, but I said, God willing, I will. She said, okay, keep looking. So one day I was getting fed up because she used to laugh and say, found anything yet? So I said, okay, find something wrong with Christianity. She didn't even have to read a book. She came out with so many things that were in the Bible that we'd never, nobody had ever mentioned to us in study groups. So I thought, okay, instead of studying Islam, let me have a evaluation of Christianity. And she gave me a book called, um, something, the Bible Thumpers Combat Book or something by um, Ahmed Dida. After I read that, I said, that's it. I'm Muslim because I had never realized there were so many faults in Christianity. 
And when you look back at the history of Christianity, it's been changed so many times. It's no longer the word of God. But Islam is exactly as it was when it was made. And there is no fault. And then she, when I said, I want to become Muslim, she said, OK, but I'll show you one more thing. Because she saw I wasn't really 100% convinced. I was leaning that way. She said, go back, put your computer on, go on YouTube and put the miracles of the Quran. And I was amazed how many things that were in there that nobody could have known in those days. Some things they only found out 50 years ago that are true, that have been there all along. So I saw that Islam was the perfect religion. Several years I plodded on reading and learning more and Hamida was against his, the hijab. She actually wrote a book about it and she worked on the theory that the hijab doesn't hide you and hijab should hide you. So if you don't wear hijab and you wear normal clothes that just cover you, you're more hidden, which in theory works. So I never really questioned it. And then after a few years, there was a, another revert. She'd married a Muslim and come to Islam because of her husband. And she worked at the nursery where my youngest boy was going. And she wore hijab. And the people there were saying to her, look, if you don't stop wearing it, you're gonna have to leave because the parents are complaining. They don't want Muslim influence in the nursery school. And she was fighting with them about it. And I said to her, you don't need to wear it. I'm Muslim too. You don't need to wear hijab. She goes, no, no, you do. I said, no, no, I'll give you Hamida's book. And she said, OK, but do me a favour. You read some other books too. You tell me where in Hadith or Quran it says you don't have to wear it now. So I said, OK. So I went back to the same shop and I said to the brother there, Salam Alaikum, can I have a book about hijab? And he said, oh, Alhamdulillah, at last you're going to start wearing hijab. And I said, no, I'm going to read about hijab. OK, he said. So I, I got two books about hijab and I got home, I opened the bag and there was a hijab. He'd put one in the bag with the pins and everything. And I laughed, I thought, no, he's not getting me this time. It's not gonna happen. I spent the weekend, I'd spoke to her on the Friday, got the books on the Saturday, spent Sunday reading them. On Monday, I put on the hijab. At this point, my parents exploded. It was bad enough that I'd then, by this time, married a Muslim. But now I was looking like one. Uh, my dad never did accept Islam. He never did believe it. He didn't want to talk about it. And he died before there was any chance to say anything really substantial to him. But my mother, in a way I was lucky, she got cancer. And there was only me and my brother. My brother wasn't a helpful type of person. So when my mum got cancer, I went and nursed her and stayed with her. It took six weeks to kill her from the day she was diagnosed to the day she died. And before that, any time anything about Islam, she would become quite aggressive with me. One day in the hospital, because she was hospitalised right from the start, there's Anna gone on my phone, so I thought, oh, I have to do my salah. And I looked, my mum was asleep. So I thought, I'll try and do it quickly before she wakes up. And I just put my mat on the floor and started, and I heard her groaning and moaning, waking up. And I'm thinking, I've never read whether you're allowed to break your salah for your mum or not. So I thought, what do I do? If she calls me, do I stop and do it later? Do I carry on? And I was really worried. But I carried on with my salah and she was quiet. And when I finished, and I got up, she's wide awake, and she looked at me and she said, did you pray for me? And I was so pleased, because before, if she caught me in her house or in my house when she was there doing salah, oh, you're wasting your time. Why'd you bother put yourself in the dirty floor for? This is not religion, this is just stupidity. But that time, she was happy. And I talked to her a bit about Islam and she seemed to listen, but then she went into a coma for the last week and couldn't talk. I played Quran to her. I kept telling her, you know, how would, if she wanted to do Shahada, this is how you would do it. She couldn't speak. So I don't know if she, in her heart she did it or not. I don't know. Inshallah, she did.
before I was Muslim, I used to do artwork to supplement my income. And then I went to a lecture and they said to paint or make anything that should have had a soul, like a horse or a person or any animal, is haram. I couldn't validate whether this was true or not, but it wasn't worth taking the risk. So I decided I would stop doing these sort of paintings. So I took up Islamic art. I went to Turkey to a university in Konya to learn calligraphy, which was really hard as I can't read or write Arabic. But I thoroughly enjoyed it. And this is some of the examples of the work that I've done. When I first became Muslim, I didn't know much about fasting and didn't really notice anybody doing it. So the first two years, I didn't do it. I wasn't aware that it was going on and nobody said anything. The third year when I was Muslim, I got married to a Muslim guy and he didn't fast. So still I didn't know anything about it. It wasn't until I put the hijab and I met the sisters in Northampton. And they said to me, soon is Ramadan. I said, oh, I've read about this. What about it? They said, but you have to fast. And you have to go mosque at night. I was like, wow. Seven years I'm Muslim, nobody's told me. Nobody's been, they don't want to admit there's anything hard because then they have to do it in front of you. So nobody told me. So this year was very, very hard. I spent most of Ramadan with, with this family. I moved in with them. And it was wonderful. One of the hardest things becoming a new Muslim is to learn Islam, the true Islam. When you first become a Muslim, you automatically go to the Muslim people and say, what about this Islam? And the one from Morocco will say, oh, we do this, we do this, and we dress like this, and this is hijab, and this is salah, and this is what we eat, this is halal, this is haram. And you think, okay, now I have it, I've got it, perfect. Then you meet somebody from Egypt, and they say, no, 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 that's not hijab, this is hijab, that's not salah, this is salah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, what do you do? And then you think, okay, I'll go to the mosque, I'll ask the imam, and maybe the imam's from Pakistan. And they'll say, no, sister, these two are wrong. This one, this is the right Islam. And I, the majority of people who influenced me at first were Pakistanis. The first advice I give to anyone who wants to come to Islam is please do not talk to Muslim people. Read. Read everything you can. Check where it comes from first. Read at least three books on one subject because maybe one's wrong. And follow your heart because common sense will tell you which is right and which is wrong. The thing that brought me to Islam is the feminism, the freedom for women. We wear hijab because we're beautiful and our beauty is only for our husband, not for anyone in the street. When I was, I didn't really want to wear hijab. I came to it very slowly. It's very difficult. It's hard to get used to wearing something if you've never worn it before. So I asked one woman, She's worn it all her life. I said, how do you wear it? Why do you wear it? It's such a nuisance. It's so hard. The doorbell goes, you've got to think, oh God, put my hijab. You can't just answer those. The postman's there waiting. And I was very negative about it. And she said, okay. And she brought a plate of sweets. She said, would you like a sweet? So I picked the one with a nice wrapper. And she said, you've just proved that hijab is right. No man's going to pick or like the sweet that's open. Maybe it's dusty, maybe the flies have been on it. The one with the wrapper. Everyone will go for the one with the wrapper because you know it's clean and it's the same thing. I lived abroad for a few years and when I came back, it was just after the problem in London of the bombings of the bus. And I found I mean, I'd always had abuse of being a Muslim. There was always stupid things said to me and occasionally things thrown and just stupid, petty things. But after the bombings, it became very, very bad. At one point in the street, 
three young black kids decided they were going to take my hijab off. And I'd got my pin at the back, my pin at the front, so there was no way it was coming off without my head or my hair going with it. And I used to do karate, so when they were pulling at the back, I just turned around and I hit one of them. And when the police come, there was CCTV of the whole event, and they cautioned me for assault. I lived in a small town outside of London, about 80 miles north. Very, very small Muslim community, and most of them hid away. The women didn't wear hijab because the problem had got so bad. At one point, somebody set fire to my car outside my house. I had Paki painted on the wall of my house, and I got abuse on a daily basis. In the end, I got an exchange and I came to London because here you can walk around the streets and you're not at risk. But outside of London, it really is a big problem. As a single woman, you can't go out, you can't be safe, you get abuse even on the buses, out shopping. My daughter, who was at the time 24, didn't believe me. She said, oh, mum, it can't be that bad. So she followed me through the town, some metres behind me, and she doesn't dress as a Muslim. And she was horrified at how many people would spit at me just because I'm Muslim. Wow, what an interesting video. First of all, I loved everything about it. She wasn't trying to hide anything. She was, I feel like people really speak the truth when it's time for them to speak out. She met someone wanted to have them change their religion, but it turned out that she's one that was influenced in the end. But um, the funny part of her story is when she goes to this person, they say, no, this is hijab, this is not. She goes to this other person, they give her another advice. The other person as well will say something different. At the end of the day, at least they're still practicing um, what they believe in. I don't know what the difference is exactly, but maybe one day I'll find out. Uh, but for people that sit down and actually abuse you because of what you believe in, in the 21st century, people have issues. Why, why is it? And something interesting she said at the beginning is, this is not what she's used to seeing about Muslims. Do you understand? Because we're being shown that bad, that these terrorists, Whatever it is, that's what we're being shown. Why can't we be shown how minorities are actually affected by people that think they're up there? Not just Muslims, but other minorities as well. And how they are affected by, um, by others, others around. And the kids that were wanted to pull off the hijab. Why, as a child, why are you so sick in the head that you would want to disrespect the way someone is dressed respect them you don't have to love it you don't have to do it but respect someone's beliefs someone's dressing and everything another thing i wrote this down i wanted to ask you guys if there's anyone with a copy of the purpose of women in islam or maybe can i find it just out there on the internet and can download a copy please let me know down below Otherwise, loved this, loved everything about it, and that's that. If there's anything I'm forgetting to say, I'm sure I'll mention it in my next video or something. But let me know what you guys think. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. And I'll see you in my next reaction video.